So uh, I'm Howard Dickey White, the CMO, and these are four incredibly important talks. And it's all, all the PowerPoints are in your handouts. So I'm, uh, I have an hour and a half to do four talks, so I'm not going to go through every slide. But it's all there. And I'll hang around for about five minutes after my talk to answer any questions. And so most of this stuff is uh, self-explanatory. So everybody has sepsis to death, not just the patients. So I won't spend a lot of time on sepsis. And again, your handout is there. So basically, uh, most of you are mid-levels. Uh, they look, the feds look at our sepsis bundle. And I actually sort of circumvented that at UH because uh, as a CMO, I went to all of our hospital presidents and CMOs. And the sepsis bundle is uh, sort of hard to measure. So basically, it'll be, you know, you'll, you, everybody knows it now, or mostly do except for students. And basically, you know, antibiotics within really an hour after in septic shock or three hours otherwise. Blood cultures, lactate, fluids if they're uh, in septic shock, 30 per kilogram, which is a big problem. We won't talk about that today. We won't get into controversies here because uh, you fluid overload a lot of people. If they're not in septic shock, a liter. The good news is there are sepsis order sets at both UH and Mercy, and I'd follow them. But what we did with UH, my recommendation to Dr. Annabelle, who's head of quality, is just look at sepsis mortality. Because uh, even though uh, we're not responsible for what goes on in the inpatient units, the idea is, is you know, if we do our job, we should help mortality. And all these different proxies are a little bit confusing. So uh, nationally, mortality is about 15%. I think we're about 11% at UH right now. So, uh, you know, you get these annoying emails saying, Dr. White, you uh, breached the sepsis order set because you didn't get a repeat lactate in six hours. And of course, they're always upstairs in six hours anyway. So, so you need to know about the bundle anyway because we're, we're, we're measuring on the bundle. And, you know, sepsis is numero uno as far as mortality these days. It's why it's so important. Uh, and nothing has a mortality of 10% anymore. I mean, trauma, all over trauma is 5%. Uh, you know, STEMIs are even less than 5% right now. Uh, PEs are 2%. Heart failure is less than 5%. So there's nothing really like sepsis. And just like everything else in the world, the Fed sort of screwed things up because of misinterpretation of data. And everybody thought in the last 10 years, the sepsis mortality went up, up, and up. It really didn't. They thought the incidents went up, up, and up. It really didn't. It was really a, a crisis in coding. Uh, more inpatient doctors code things as sepsis. Why? Because grandma comes in who's altered. They bring her in. They culture her. They find nothing. And you got to have some justification. It was a, it was a legitimate admission, right? You got to bring them in. Uh, but what they code them as is sepsis. And the way, that, the way they found this was wrong was I think it was May 1st, 2013, New England Journal of Medicine, four researchers from Harvard show that the source of sepsis didn't increase over 10 years, so how could sepsis increase? So there's a lot of misinterpretation here. Again, look, look, at, look at my slides, but it is a problem. And let me get something uh, that's important here. All right, uh, what do you need to know as a mid-level, especially in sepsis, and that is when you suspect sepsis. This was February 13th uh, last year, February 23rd, and basically they looked at something called a Q-SOFA score. So when you look at my slides, if you combine Q-SOFA with Sears, what do you find out? You find out something we knew 30 years ago. You find out that people might be septic if they have a couple of six factors. The Sears criteria are tachypnea, tachycardia, lower high white count, uh, and fever, right? Those are four. Q-SOFA is three. But, the, uh, but they have tachypnea, so if you add the other two, it's ultimate status and hypotension. So what does it tell you? It tells you if you have someone who might be tachypnic, tachycardic, fever, white count, alter, and hypotension, they might be septic. Uh, God, I knew it was my wife. I'll have to call her back in a little bit. Uh, she's the only one who hammer pages me, thank God, most of the time. So. Uh, you need to know as a mid-level and a physician if someone comes in with a couple of those six criteria, suspect sepsis, and go to your sepsis order set. And Paul had all these sophisticated slides and antibiotic choice. The good news is you don't have to know all that stuff. 
Go to your order set. Most of the time your anabolic choices are there and dose are there. And yes, we do underdose people with vancomycin, so he's right about that. 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. So uh, know the six factors of sepsis. Uh, this is, uh, you know, all, how, how prevalent sepsis is. I'm not sure if the 52.4% of all hospital deaths is still true. Is that right, Don? You know what the percentage of hospital deaths is as far as sepsis? Is it that high? That seems really high to me. But it's still significant. Uh, so recognize it. Here are the serious criteria. So fever, high or low. Heart rate greater than 90. Respiratory rate greater than 20. White blood cell count yield below 4,000 or greater than 12,000. And you know, just realize you have to have a suspected infection. And I don't think it's in my slides, but let's do a little bit of a show and tell here. Uh, what, are, what are the six or seven sources of infection? So you go, to, you go to the bedside, let's say someone's got a heart rate of 95, all right? So right off the bat, you know they have one series criteria. What, what are the sources of infection? Because you, you have to have Sears and QCF criteria plus suspected infection. So starting from here up, you got let's go, intra-abdominal, all right? So intra-abdominal would be one source. Uh, back here, renal would be another source. Go up a little bit, pulmonary, another source. That's three. What else are we missing here? So CNS is four, skin soft tissue, five, heart, endocardium, like endocarditis, is six, medical devices, Number seven, medical procedures. Number eight, so if they had recent dental work, stuff like that for procedure, if anybody has metal in them, our new central line, new, new port of entry. So the point is, every time, it's not hard. I'm old and even I can remember six or seven things, right? So you know Sears and Q Sofa. You go and talk to somebody, and then you ask them, you go through review systems. You know, any, any problems or pain when you urinate, you know? Uh, you know, do you have cough and cold? Uh, do you have abdominal pain? Uh, do you have a history of a heart murmur? Recent dental work? Any metal on you? Okay, those are easy questions to ask because you can have two serious criteria. You can have to kidney attack cardiac, and they're going to be in heart failure, right? Mm -hmm. So if they have no suspected infection, that person has heart failure, not sepsis, and it's really annoying to have some hospital risk manager email me and say, Dr. White, you're an idiot because someone came in with two serious criteria and you didn't culture them up. And I go back, no, you're an idiot. <laughs> Read my chart, there was no suspected infection. Uh, people who come in with GI bleeds, they get the, same, they get the same emails, right? They came in tachycardic and maybe they have a white kind of 13,000 and why didn't I start my antibiotics? box? Well, did you read my note? They were hemocult positive, hemoglobin was five, you know? So they were tachycardic because they were GI bleeding. But they're doing their job, we're doing our job. So it's got to be Sears Q Sofa with suspected infection. And if you go through the seven or eight sources we just talked about, you won't miss suspected infection. Any questions or comments so far? And uh, what else do we have here? OK, uh, that's Q Sofa. Q Sofa, you don't need a calculator. We just talked about it, seven things, right? Uh, so the bundle, which we're still graded on, although we circumvented that at UH, is, is just this. And no, so know your bundle. So it's uh, lactate, blood cultures, broad spectrum antibiotics, and fluids. And in my CMO report next month, I've got a really nice paper as a bonus paper by Paul Merrick, who's an intensivist, who I think is a brilliant guy. And he showed that we're really fluid overloading too many people at 30 per kilogram even after septic. So these people that have cardiomyopathies, these people with chronic kidney disease, you just can't go blindly give them 30 per kilogram. So when you see their order set, be careful before you check that box, okay? Now if they're, you know, most of these people in the room, if they're one of you folks, and you have no cardiac problems, you're 30 years old, and uh, you know, you had a cystoscope three days ago, and you have 102 fever, uh, you, can give, you can give you a 60 cc's per kilogram, you'll be fine, you'll just pee it out, right? So comorbidities make a big, big difference, but be very careful uh, before you give 30 per kilogram people who've got uh, reasons where they may get fluid overloaded pretty quickly. 
Uh, that's why one size doesn't fit all. That's why it's a problem. And uh, really, there's no argument that if you see someone's got an infection, so suspected infection, and even one serious criteria, why would you wait with antibiotics? Uh, so get a good history like Paul talked about and get them a first dose. And your choice is based on source and beta-lactam allergy, stuff like that. It's all in the order sets. Fluid therapy we just talked about. If someone comes in with, with, with uh, stage four or, uh, CKD and they are tachycardic and a white count of 13.5 and they might have a urinary tract infection, you may want to bolus them 500 at a time, 500 cc at a time rather than all, the whole 30 per kilogram, even if they're hypotensive. And we won't talk about ultrasound at the bedside and non-invasive cardiac op monitoring today, but there are other things you can have, you can use that will make this easier to treat patients with. Most of the time we don't have it in real time. And then the, the, we talked about the first three parts of the bundle. Uh, the next three are uh, if they're really in septic shock, as you're, as you're administering fluids, you probably want to start pressures pretty quickly. And there's a, uh, a policy that I'm going to get to the UH medical directors. I'll get it to Ken and Zach also. Uh, not, the, the basically, you give pressures peripherally. All right? So it's, we're probably 10 years behind the time. But basically, if you have someone in septic shock and their pressure, their MAP doesn't respond to fluids, you can actually, if you have, a, if you have a, an 18 gauge or larger line in the forearm or up here, and you check, have the nurses check the line hourly, you can give per palmeric 0.2 mics per kilogram per minute. So 70 kilogram person, that's up to 14 mics. That's a large dose of levofed for at least eight hours. So if you're busy and you're doing 50 things at one time and grandma comes in who's diabetic, who also has had a cough and cold with 101 fever, and you, you know your white count yet, but you think that she may have sepsis because she's hypotensive also, and she doesn't respond to the first 500 cc fluid you give, uh, you can really, you, you need to talk to your chief medical officer and your ED director, because you can definitely give pressors peripherally for several hours, as long as you have a good line and as long as your nurses check the site hourly. Okay? Another story for another day. But I think one thing we don't do as well as we should do is get pressure started on these people. Some of the doctors agree with me? Even if you don't, thanks for saying yes. Okay? So uh, everything's timed right now. And, uh, you know, the beauty of all this stuff, there's a lot of downside I talked about. The beauty is I think we're more vigilant and looking at these folks with a lot of comorbidities who come in a little bit tachycardic and a little bit altered. And instead of just ordering a lot of tests, I think we're more vigilant in at least culturing them up and getting them treated. Because in the old days, we didn't. All right? And uh, I'll have some cases for you to look at here, but uh, it really depends on us to get things started. Because as you'll see, once they're admitted to an inpatient unit, nothing much happens. So, uh, you know, everybody's got sepsis order sets for nurses to draw labs, culture them up, let the doctor know. So that, well, the first one was UH, this one's Mercy. It's all the same thing. And uh, we talked about the bundles. Let me talk about a couple cases. And we're going to keep on going here. So uh, these are real cases. 75-year-old man with BPH, problems voiding. He's got a bump in his creatinine. Uh, Foley is placed, and he's got a heart rate of 92. Not to Kipnik, afebrile, BP's okay, white counts 13,000, one, two, that's two serious criteria, right? Although pretty subtle, right? A white count and uh, tachycardia. So this person was admitted to the floor, and he kept on deteriorating, and it wasn't until day two at 1500, the guy sort of went south in septic shock. So you see, once they leave the ER, things take a while. It took 14 hours to get this guy treated. And I would say that talking to that guy wasn't my patient. If he was recently instrumented, he had a 92 heart rate, 
and a little bit of white count, uh, I, would, I would treat them because we had a source, suspected source, and two serious criteria. Or if you don't, at least document why you don't. But I think the benefits versus risk favor treating this guy. All right, that happens every day in every hospital, unfortunately. Uh, good case, case number two. 27 year old female, school teacher, went to her OB at 34 weeks gestation for the flu, sore throat, achy, et cetera, and vital signs in the OB's office, borderline tachycardia, looked okay. All right? So again, and again, if you got to think about this, when you're really stressed in the day and you're feeling terrible, take your pulse. It's hard to get your heart rate to 90. Really hard to get it to 100, 110, right? So in, and when you're in pain, take your pulse. I, your heart rate's 74, you know? So to say the patient's in pain, you know, they're, uh, you know, it's only borderline. You know, tachycardia is really a kiss of death. We'll talk about that later and talk about medical decision making. So one trial B really was okay. Probably not septic, right? Uh, but OB, though, was smart, said she'd go to the ER for evaluation. And she went home, did some errands, went to the local ER, started feeling a little bit dizzy. And look, look at her an hour, hour or two later. 116, 22, 70 over 40. All right? So again, uh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'd probably be pretty concerned about this person. So uh, this person, you know, at the ER, Yes, patient septic, but the good news is she was treated really quickly and did fine, right? So this patient, you can give them 80 per kilogram, do fine. So, you know, she got her fluids, uh, all labs, antibiotics, and uh, was discharged home three days later. So early recognition, that's what we do for a living. Really be vigilant, really know how to ask questions on sources of infection, and treat appropriately. And if you don't treat, document why you, don't, why you didn't treat the patient, all right? Uh, case number three, a 63-year-old retired steel worker with comorbidities, so uh, hypertension, diabetes, COPD, smoker, uh, worsening dyspnea, uh, and he was tech cardiac, he was the kid, this guy was sick, right? 15-5 Y count, but lungs were clear. And uh, basically, this guy, when they talked to him, probably no source of infection. And basically, although he had these serious criteria, he basically was COPD or exacerbation. He wasn't septic. So again, no real source here. Really didn't have, you know, pure and sputum, things like that. So uh, he responded nicely to steroids and duonebs and uh, was admitted and did fine and actually had recent steroids which counted for his white count. All right? So you get the idea. So if you have someone with two or more vital sign, or serious criteria or Q-self criteria, go through your source of infection and act accordingly, okay? And as a mid-level, you can be as vigilant about this as a doctor can. So uh, go for it, okay? Uh, and uh, that's it. So any questions on sepsis? The whole PowerPoint is in your book. <laughs>